Hi there, and welcome to the Digital Insurance Point Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Reed, and as always, I am joined by my co-hosts, Adam Mitchell, CEO of Mitchell & Whale, Steve Earl, CEO of Cheap Insurance, and Jeff Roy, CEO of Excalibur Insurance. And today, we are pleased to be joined by Sharif Jamal, CEO of Many, Many Things, which we'll be getting into later. Sharif, how's it going? Yeah, great. I missed you guys. I haven't seen you guys in so long. This is uh, it's exciting. Yeah, this is a continuation of the basement tapes. Everybody's uh, hunkered down to avoid uh, getting COVID. So uh, anyway, glad to, uh, in fact, I think you and I are probably about uh, 1.5 kilometers apart physically. Pretty but, much. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> way. Hey, the last, the, last time, the last time we were all together was at an Aviva in Las Vegas, all, all of us together, right? Probably three years ago. Oh, oh Vegas, boy. man. Oh, oh Vegas, man. man. My back when we were, back when you could travel back in the day, remember that? It was my last trip before the COVID hit. My wife and I were saying it was almost a year to the day. We were actually down in Vegas, wondering whether we should get back to Canada because of this COVID thing. It Anywho, feels like forever. It does. It yeah. does. So, Sharif, tell us. Uh, just uh, you know, I think a lot of people know who you are, but not everybody knows you know, the things that you are. You know, keep you busy every day. That you know the uh, the empire, one might say, of companies that you're. Uh, you, you uh, control and, and operate. So you can just give us a high level view of uh, what your world uh, encompasses. First and foremost, primarily is the, 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 the brokerages. So I've got uh, um, three brokerages. Um, Sharp Insurance, which is a brokerage I started a number of years ago. Uh, Gold Key Insurance, which is a brokerage uh, acquired uh, two and a half years ago which is a little broker just outside of, uh, of Calgary. And, uh, and then Link Insurance, which is another broker we acquired last year. Um, each operates uh, independently uh, right now. Some of them are soon gonna, you know, kind of come together. So that's the, the insurance business. Um, Trufla, the, the technology business, which was spun out of uh, Sharp Insurance and, a number of years ago. And then, uh, the last one is uh, called Gold Key Registry. So we own a registry uh, service, which um, we acquired with Gold Key Insurance. Um, in Alberta, registry services are, uh, are privatized. So it does, you know, we do the um, plate renewals, corporate, corporate uh, you know, registry, annual filings, uh, birth certificates, driver training, all that kind of stuff through our... Uh, our registry. Just out of interest, approximately how many people uh, work in total work for those companies? All in right now, we're about 140, 140 people. Awesome. Wow. That's great. Uh, did, did I hear that you do birth certificates? Yeah. Really? What's your new age now? I'm sorry? <laughs> I, I never, I never, I, I never, oh, oh. I never your passed. New? I never passed 25. I don't know why. There you <laughs> yeah. go. Hey, Sharif's always been a new age broker. Come on. I don't look, I don't look it. <laughs> I kind of stopped at 25 and I just change it every year until, uh, you know, until whenever. But the only thing you don't do is, you don't, the only thing you only do is marry people. Pretty much got her all well, covered, do, right? Do that too, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I know a guy who knows a guy, whoever, uh, whoever wants anything, uh, anything fixed up. Awesome. Okay, so let's let's get into our speed round here, so folks can get to know you a bit better. So, uh, what's your favorite Canadian band of all time? The Hip. Hip. Okay, solid choice. We've had a few of those. Uh, they're obviously very popular. Which uh, what beer you got going there? Uh, well, the one I've opened up is the Garrison. Uh, Garrison awesome. beer. Awesome. Shout out. And thank shout you out for our, the beers. Shout out to Garrison, our best best beer sponsor. Um, what was your high school nickname? Uh, jelly. Jelly. Okay. <laughs> what was your favorite donut? Was it also jelly? Uh, well, it's the Boston cream, which I guess. Uh, it's jelly-like, jelly -like, I guess. Jelly-like custard, yeah. Jelly-like. Yeah, Boston cream is an awesome donut. Uh, yeah. Who's your favorite Muppet? I was really big on the Muppets. I don't remember. No, no, none of the above is also a choice. Yeah, none That's of the cool. above. I wasn't really a Muppet, uh, Muppet guy growing up. Yeah, I recommend everybody watch the Muppet episode that had Alice Cooper on it. Classic. <laughs> anyway, uh, how many cups of coffee do you uh, down in a day? Anywhere between two and four. You can average three. Depends on the day. And you're drinking them black right now, right? Drinking them black. Drinking them black. A little sweetener in there. 
You know, it's not the best way to drink it, but it'll do for now. What is your favorite sandwich? I mean, my favorite food, period, is sandwiches. Anything between two pieces of uh, bread. But I would have to say <laughs> it is, uh, seriously, Danico's Sandwich at uh, Pepino's Sandwich Shop in, uh, in Calgary. Let's, let's get into some more uh, in-depth questions here. So um, you and I have known each other for a while, so I know that you, know, you didn't get into insurance right away. You know, you had, so tell us about your, your previous uh, work and, and wh why did you join the insurance industry? Like not a lot of people make that choice, uh, but you, you, know, you were a fully fledged adult working, you know, doing, a, doing a serious job and you said, you know what, I'm going to give up this illustrious uh, career and move into insurance. So tell us about that. Uh, when I was still in university, I started up my, uh, my first company coming out, of, uh, coming out of university and it was called uh, Air Portables. So, you know, I had stores set up in different airports across the country and rented out portable DVD players and movies uh, to passengers that traveled. WestJet, you know, I'd worked at WestJet before and they didn't have any kind of entertainment. So I partnered up with a, with a company called Rogers Video. If you remember Rogers, uh, Rogers Video, they provided the, the movies. We had the source set up. So we were in Calgary, Edmonton, Toronto, Hamilton, uh, Ottawa, Montreal, um, and yeah, people rented these DVD players, dropped them off on the other side. I actually uh, like like saying this, you know, I, I'm going to take credit for um, the Netflix model. They were just smarter than they had smarter than I did. What, what we used to do is we had these, uh, you know, we had these stores with with all these DVDs, and airports are like little cities. So I came up with this model where we'd create a, a membership program for airport employees. They can get unlimited movies. They can watch all the movies they wanted. They just, you know, they can only have one at a time. So they, they, they take a movie, go home, watch it, you know, kind of bring it back, trade it up for another uh, movie. We just never thought about digital at the, at the time. So Netflix kind of beat me to the punch, but I'm going to say I had the idea. I actually remember that. I uh, was a customer of yours. And, I used oh, to really? Have, yeah, I flew, you know, I've flown quite a bit of my career, you know, having worked out West and companies that are headquartered back east. So I've flown a lot in my career and I have, uh, I, uh, back in the day when that was actually around, I, uh, I, I did rent at least once from you. What got so, you into the, into the insurance industry? Um, I, I ended up uh, going bankrupt and then kind of went into the work world. And I, I always kind of knew I wanted to get back into business somehow. Um, so left, went into the work world. My business partner at the time. L literally bankrupt? Literally or figure bankrupt. of speech. No, no, literally wow. bankrupt. Lost, lost what everything. A, what a cool story. Yeah, I bankrupt my dad. My dad had put all his money into uh, the business. Wow. Uh, bankrupt my dad. Uh, I was actually forced. That's why I moved to Winnipeg because I just needed to get out of Calgary because it was just a really bad time in my uh, my life. And my dad gave me, you know, pretty much his last five hundred bucks and said, you know, this is all I got. I'll take you to Winnipeg. You know, you can start from scratch there. And I, I literally had to build up from, uh, from scratch. Uh, wow. Harp, my, who was my business partner that I started Sharp with, um, he went into insurance um, after, you know, we'd lost that business. And uh, he was working for ING at the time. He was in the commercial uh, training program. So he, he kind of learned the insurance business. He became a broker. And, you know, and then I, I was working my... Uh, my job. I was actually working for a company called Pitney Bowes. So I was selling mail equipment, um, mail machines, and um, and that was in Winnipeg. And then I got transferred to Calgary to manage the team there. So when I went back to Calgary, uh, I left there, went to oil and gas, and then I started learning about the insurance business from from Harp because I'd visit him at his office, and I'd always ask him, "Well, what do you do to 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 grow your business? What do you do to bring clients in?" And he said, "Well, we kind of just wait for the phone to ring." And as a sales guy, I was like, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't understand what you're, what you're saying. So one day we did a little experiment and um, I told Harp to grab the, the, the phone book. He grabs the phone book and I said, okay, pick any business in the, in the phone book. So he picked the business and I cold called it for him and I got in touch with the controller and I got him an appointment. And two months later, he ended up writing the account and it was the biggest commercial account he'd ever written. So I was like, huh. Um, you know, this insurance thing, how hard can it be? I mean, I used to sell mail machines. So he was thinking about buying into the brokerage that he was uh, working at. I convinced him not to. 
I said, listen, let's just start from, from scratch. I'll do the sales thing. You do the uh, insurance thing. You'd be like the entourage. And he didn't want to um, lose out on the opportunity to buy into the brokerage that he was, uh, he was working at. So I had to pretty much get the contract and everything myself. Literally walked into Intac's office, uh, downtown Calgary with a business plan in hand, went to the receptionist and said, um, hi, I'd like to talk to someone about selling your product. And the receptionist is like, are you, are you a broker? And I'm like, well, no, but I'm going to be one. And she thought that was really weird. And so at, at that time, one of the regional VPs was walking by and she kind of grabbed her and she, you know, took me into a, a boardroom and we just started talking and she's like, well, that, what's that in your hand? I'm like, oh, that's my business plan. So she looks at the business plan and she's like, oh, you know, this might work. And we had, it had nothing to do with digital. I mean, we were just, you know, I was, we were going to focus on, um, you know, various ethnic communities and just kind of sell into those communities and try to grow. And, um, and she says, you know, today's your, your lucky day. I'm head of the uh, diversity council and uh, we want to grow in, in different, uh, different communities. So um, she said, do you have your license? I was like, well, of course. So I went to pull out my driver's license. I didn't know you had to be licensed to, to, sell, uh, to sell insurance. And uh, she said, no, you have to be licensed. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll go get my license. And if I get my license, will you give me a contract? She said, yes, get your license, we'll give you a contract. And two weeks later, I got my license. One month later, we got a contract and we started, that was kind of the start of Sharp. So that's how I got into the insurance industry. It's a really long story. Well, that's awesome. Um, and uh, that was around the time, uh, probably a little bit later, that you and I had met. Um, yeah. We were subletting a uh, broker. Uh, a broker link office and uh and you had ended up uh at least in that one and we ended up that's when we ended up meeting which was uh oh, fantastic so um that's great that's a great story thank you very much um and so now you are managing uh both bricks and mortar brokerages as well as you know digital uh, fully digital one can you um describe how the challenges differ are there any are the staff any different in terms of their skill set demographics you know, that kind of thing. We hear, we hear about a lot of difference between bricks and mortar and digital. And you're actually, you actually live in it. Right? Under, your, under one roof, you've got both these operations. So maybe just tell our listeners how these things differ. What are the, what are the key differentiating factors? Number one differentiator is, is people. That, 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 that's, that's what it comes down to. I mean, operation-wise, you know, I guess your biggest difference um, between you know, bricks and mortar and digital is really this, the person sitting in front of you, right? Like in, in a digital operation, you don't really see the person. You manage them a little bit differently using digital tools, um, but you can get a lot of that in a, in, a, in a bricks and mortar operation as well, which is what we do. And, you know, from the time we acquired um, Gold Key, especially, you know, because it's, it's, it's even more rural than, um, than Link, you know, th th there was a little apprehension from the people, but when they start, you know, getting immersed in the digital world, they start seeing the digital tools you're using, especially in internally, and they embrace it. Um, it works. It works out uh, great. You absolutely can have a marriage of the of the two worlds. And I actually think the best example is not even us. I mean, you look at. Um, you know, Lance Miller and Matt Alston, I mean, you know, they started their operation as a bricks and mortar in little town, McGrath, Alberta, that's got a population of like, a, you know, a couple thousand people into, you know, Surex, what it is, uh, what it is today, you, can, you know, and they still operate uh, a bricks and mortar. So you can definitely bring the two worlds uh, together and really it comes down to your people. Cool. Yeah. Well, we, we all know Lance and the, the Surex experience. So a great example of, uh, you know, how you can start in a small spot and evolve digitally. Uh, take us over to the Trufla. Uh, you've got a really good tech company. Maybe take us back a little bit of how you got into building a tech company, where it evolved from, and to describe what you're doing at Trufla right now. So Trufla is, uh, you know, kind of evolved over the, the years. Um, it actually started in 2010. So one day... Uh, you know, my business partner and I are, are, were talking about some stuff and, you know, we thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we had a mobile app for our customers? At the time, the iPhone 3 had just come out and everybody and their dog was building apps for, for, for everything. So literally, we thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we had an app? And so we hired a couple of university students and we built a mobile app 
um, or Sharp. It was a static app. It was form based. There was no, you know, live data in it or anything like uh, like that. Um, and what we didn't realize actually, we kind of learned later, was that app was the very first mobile app for insurance in North America, uh, for 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 agents. Like it was it was the first of its uh, of its kind, um, even from a carrier perspective. Um, you know, for, for agents and we we're actually pretty proud of that. So we started developing it a little more and then we, you know, we, we ran into struggles, which we were, which we overcame to getting data feeds in there so we can populate the data, which we all know, you know, sometimes it's a challenge in the industry. Um, you know, and then we started getting approached by other brokerages in our, in our trading area. They were like, Hey, that's kind of cool. Is that, is that something we could use? We're like, well, you know, maybe. And so in 2014, we formalized, a, you know, the company called Sharp Mobile Technology, which kind of became the software house that licensed the mobile app. And then we started building out additional tools under that kind of umbrella. Um, in 2015, we acquired a, a company, a digital marketing company that was doing all of our digital marketing for Sharp Insurance and was really helping accelerate our growth. Um, and they were so good at what they did. I mean, Tom, I think you remember right around that time, you know, you were, you were at Aviva around that time. And I know I was, you know, stressed out that, holy man, you know, if people find out, you know, how good these guys are, you know, there's other companies and so much, um, you know, bigger uh, revenue that can, you know, work with them and we don't want to lose them. And um, we decided at that time, that was probably, that was a core competence that we should have in house. So we acquired the company in 20, uh, 2015 and they were a digital marketing company, but they had some digital tools as, uh, as well. So they were kind of developing some, some technology as well. Um, but then in 2018, we thought we've got these two companies, you know, everyone's kind of running independent. Not sure that makes a lot of sense. We slammed them together into what is now uh, Trufla. And we get asked all the time, what the heck does Trufla even, even mean? Uh, the name was born in a drunken moment in uh, in, in Mexico, uh, and it is the Icelandic word for disruption. I had to dig deep into my Icelandic roots to to get that one uh, to get that one out. But it means disruption in in, in Icelandic, and so um, all Trufla focuses on is building digital tools for brokerages. With our focus is on brokerages, it's building tools to help accelerate the distribution of insurance. Um, through brokerages by looking at kind of the whole life cycle of an insurance policy from customer acquisition to order fulfillment uh, to servicing the, the client and, and everything in between. We now know about you, but who are you? And you said uh, the whole life cycle of the customer, but are you a BMS? Like we have mobile, uh, we have lead management, we have you can do uh, website and SEO for brokers. So I want to know a couple of things. Like, if you're all of that, why are you not a BMS? And and B, tell me who an ideal candidate is for Trufla uh, that you could bring value to today. So the, the way we're I'm kind of used to uh, BMS. The way most the, the whole industry is used to a BMS is is kind of this um, you know uh, one large piece of software you know. So, some modules to it that, that manages an entire book of business. That's not really what, what we do. We're broken down into different um, parts of the life cycle, uh, but a, a broker doesn't have to kind of get, you know, one, one big software piece. You know, if you just want to focus on one piece, you can. You want to focus on all three, you can. Uh, we look more as our, at our software as enveloping the, the, the BMS uh, system. Um, certainly we have brokers that, um, you know, there's brokerages right now that have BMS systems, but still do their accounting outside, you know, they'll use Sage or QuickBooks or whatever to, to do their accounting. That's, that's, that's one of the pieces that's kind of, um, missing, although we do integrate with, um, with outside accounting, um, well, one outside accounting, uh, software, but, um, yeah, the, the idea is that, um, it's a very light, you know, kind of airy system that's that's modular that can be, you know, that's really designed to mold according to how the the broker uh, the broker operates because really no two operations are are the are the same. 
so I have a BMS and um, I'm thinking about digital. I'm not really all that digital. I don't know. Like you said, you can sort of wrap around that BMS that you have and give you the things that um, digitize a brokerage, essentially, um, be it lead management, that mobile piece, all those things that BMSs try hard at and either try to do or don't do at all. Um, so you're, you're, you're fitting that space to, yeah. to fill that gap between digital customer experience and what a BMS could do. Yeah, I mean, the BMS captures the, the you know, it's, the way we look at it is the BMS is kind of a, a, a snapshot of a point in time, right? Like a, a broker that use, manages their policies in the BMS. You're basically managing it from the time you quoted the, the client, you know, and a little bit of the service. You're not getting the full picture of what's actually happening with that client outside of the, the BMS. We're trying to give a bigger, uh, you know, more information, a bigger picture to the, to the broker so that they see what happened with that client prior to them entering that BMS, you know, kind of what happened leading up to that. Um, you know, there, there's phases during, cause you can still interact with your client outside of the, the BMS and how they're interacting with you and then, and then, and then servicing on the, on the end. Um, you know, there's a lot more to the story. We're just trying to give the, the, the whole story to the broker because the more of the story they have, the more likely they're going to retain the client, the better service they're, they're going to give, the better experience the client is going to give and really the more profitable they're going to be because they'll really be able to hone in on where they need to from a, a, an, an operations, uh, an operations perspective. Can I, take this a, a bit of a different direction um, for a second. And I, I'm curious on your thoughts and it's a, it's a little bit off script as well. So I'll, I'll give my uh, declaration of my thought to frame some of the argument of where I'm going. Um, and then I'm really curious to get your thoughts because you, you know, currently own both ends of the spectrum. So my, my statement, as I said, um, to be provocative is there is no such thing as a digital broker. So now as a guy who would be labeled as owning a digital broker or even one of the digital brokers, as well as a guy that has a very classic operation, I'm making assumptions, I don't know the other ones. Um, I guess I won't dive into my side of it as you're, you're the guest. So what's, what's your take on, on that statement and or how you feel about the words of being called a digital broker or not? I, I'm actually on your side. I, I agree with that 100%. I, I don't think, I think the term digital broker is kind of something that we use early on as a, as a label just to denote a broker that was more advanced using digital tools. But I think we're at a time right now where really, you know, on the broker set, I'm a broker. I'm a broker that's adopted and used digital tools to make my operation more efficient you know, to try to improve my EBITDA through that efficiency, to try to grow my revenue through those, those digital tools. Um, but even when you look at, you know, th this is really fascinating for me. Even when you look at, you know, I, I think the greatest example in the insurance world right now, digital insurance world is Lemonade, obviously, you know, with, with what they've done. You know, their model right now is changing completely. And the way they're growing primarily right now is through agencies. They're taking that whole digital model by selling direct to the consumer and they've flipped it upside down realizing, wait a minute, maybe the best way to distribute is through an agency or a broker. And that is exactly what they're doing. That's how they're growing right now. And it kind of lends back, Tom, you'll probably remember this. I wrote, I wrote an article uh, probably a couple of years ago on, um, it was titled, Dear Broker, You're More Like Amazon than you think and i was comparing brokers to digital uh digital players i never said digital broker i said all brokers are like are like digital you know digital um companies well how do you compare yeah how do you compare a broker to an amazon or a google or a, or, or or a netflix or an uber or an airbnb well it's quite simple there's you know here's the the comparisons one a broker like all of those companies is nothing more than a distributor. None of those companies manufacture anything. They are all distributors. You know, Uber doesn't own any of the cars. Google doesn't curate any of the, of the like they don't build the websites. Facebook doesn't curate any of the content. Like it's all, you know, they're distributors of, 
um, either the data or, or, or whatever it is. And just like that, brokers are distributors, they're not manufacturers. No, I, it's exactly where I was hoping you'd take it. And, and in the spectrum, the other label I'd give it is there's, there's efficient brokering operations and there's inefficient brokering operations. And they, they probably have a correlation on which tools or digital tools they use. But I think it also cues up this same talk of where you're going, of you're the creator of a lot of digital tools, both for yourself, and now you've also put them out to market and said, hey, you guys can have this too. Yeah, yeah, and, and I mean, with the way we actually look at the whole business right now, yeah, we've got these brokerages, um, you know, we've got this digital focused brokerage, which is, you know, Sharp Insurance, we've got our, our traditional brokerage, which is, um, or sorry, um, bricks and mortar brokerage, you know, which is more link and gold key, but we get a kind of a whole perspective and we build tools to, that can kind of fit in all these, in these worlds to help brokers digitize their operations. Just bring digital tools to make them more efficient. That's our entire focus. Well, the, and the real, the real gold or the real under our feet right now is the data, right? Like right now, you know, getting the data, the insights you talked about, and being able to harness that, you know, that's the new natural resource going forward. What's your feelings on that about harnessing data and being able to monetize it for brokers? Because right now we're, other people are monetizing it more than the brokers are, right? So. Okay, so let me go back to what I was saying earlier about the, you know, kind of what makes a broker similar to, uh, uh, you know, a digital, uh, you know, the, these big digital tech companies. So we established one was a distributor, right? Distributor of uh, a product. Number two, is that a broker offers choice. No way could an Amazon survive if you were looking for a USB cable and you only got one, one, one option, right? Or Google wouldn't survive if the only result they gave you was Wikipedia, right? And, uh, you know, Airbnb wouldn't survive if all they gave you was, you know, a one bedroom apartment, right? They didn't have all the different, so choice is a monster. That the, the consumer craves choice, right? The third thing that different, you know, that, that that um, makes a broker similar to um, these big tech companies. But this is where brokers fail and not because it's necessarily their fault, but the, the big disconnect is data. All of these companies operate using data. So they use the data in there to their benefit. Google knows what you're typing in a search query before you end that, um, that query. And if you get it wrong, you never think Google is wrong. You go back in and delete that search query and, 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 and put it in because Google can't be wrong. They got all the, all, the, all the data, right? Amazon recommends exactly what you want based on, you know, based on the, the, the data. They know. And how many times we bought things like, oh, yeah, I can use that too. Yeah, I'll, I'll take one of those. Throw that in my, in my, uh, in my order as well from uh, Amazon, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's using data. So what we're doing now is we're taking that data and creating intelligence. So you, you guys saw we just um, recently announced the, 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 the data module that we've just released for, for brokers. And basically what we're doing is taking their data, uh, you, know, you know, aggregating the, the data and then giving that power back to the broker so they can use it. The first thing we're using it on is on the customer acquisition side, which is our true web uh, tool. So they can plug in that data into their website so that it can refresh regularly, so they embed real-time data into their content, which is the stuff that Google loves, that any search engine loves to push up those rankings. And that's when you start getting into rich snippets and, and whatnot. And so we're constantly trying to find ways for brokers to use the data, to monetize it, to increase their revenue, to improve their, um, their retention, and ultimately they're, 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 they're using the, the power of their data in the value of their own uh, brokerage. The data module, I think, is pretty cool. I just saw it launched, and you launched at Amplify, your highly successful conference the last uh, tie, two times you've done it. Uh, what, what kind of data applications with all this data that we're mining can you use to anticipate client needs and help retention? Do you have anything in your arsenal at this point, anything in development to anticipate what uh, the client consumer is going to buy next or to tell if the client's going to turn? You know, if there's any uh, uh, digital fumes or exhaust out there that you can harness from all the client journeys to be able to figure out, do you have anything of that, anything cooked in right now or? Yeah, we've got one that's coming out later this, uh, this year. Again, we, we kind of announced it uh, at, at Amplify. Well, I'm super excited about this one because this is one kind of one that we've been, you know, thinking about for a long time. It's called the broker, uh, broker X-ray. Effectively, um, it's taking the, the data and, um, 
taking a broker's book of business through this, you know, through this intelligence and being able to identify on a client by client basis, giving a broker basically one of one of three three indicators on that uh, on that client. So red means, OK, listen, this client, if this client goes out and shops, you're in a lot of trouble because a client that typically looks like this in this geographic region they are paying about this this much, right? So you need to remarket or figure something out for this client because you're you're dead. Yellow means, hey, this client's good, but they're likely underpaying. You know, if they go out and shop, you're not losing them at all. You're leaving money on the table. So you should either be increasing coverage, selling them additional products. Like here, you know, don't leave money on the table, you know, increase the, the sale. And again, it's comparing that that data set versus um, you know, an, a, an anonymized aggregated uh, data set. And the third one is green. Green is you're good. If they go out, they're not like, you're not likely to lose this client. The only reason why you'd likely to lose them is because they either had a bad experience with you, they had a bad experience with the, the insurance company on a claim or something, you know, but for the most part, you're not likely going to lose this client. So we're trying to give additional insights so that we can get brokers to hone in on where they really need to focus for their, um, you know, put their efforts to make sure they, they you know, they've worked hard to bring the client in. Now we're going to give you additional intelligence to be able to retain the client. That's crazy cool. Like, I, I, what it makes me wonder, how many, how many industry first has, has Sharif and or Trufala brought to market? Because that's one. The, the mobile app was one. Yeah, it's mobile like, app 2010, that's two. It's time to toot Sharif's horn. Because you wouldn't do that well, yourself. But what else have you done? The insurance, insurance specific lead manager, and tr now called True Leads. Um, that was one. How many other ones? Um, it'd be a fun thing to add up. I'm putting you on a hot seat, but like, <laughs> it'd be a cool thing to put out there of for the betterment of brokers. Hey, here's three things from the innovative Icelandic company. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the mobile app was definitely you know it's that's a, that's a big one for uh, for us. Um, you know, we've shown a lot of brokers. I know you, everyone here has seen it. You know, it was a tool that we built at Sharp Insurance years ago that we're now um, building onto True Leads, which is you know our Sharp One platform, which was our kind of internal lead management um, tool that quotes and issues the policy and kind of does everything. Internally, that was one. Um, Wait, different? I don't know about this one, uh, which means probably well, a lot of listeners don't know about this one. So is this well, different than True Leads? Well, I think uh, yes. Yeah, so I think True Leads is getting a facelift. As a True Lead user, as yeah. you see below, uh, maybe maybe tell the group and uh, you made some announcement to Amplify, but tell the panel here what you're doing to beef up True True Leads under the hood. Back in 2012 uh, or 2013? No, it wasn't 2012. 2014 even. Um, you know, we built a, a tool that we use internally. We still use it internally at Sharp. At Sharp, it's called Sharp One. This tool was a, a lead management uh, tool that captures the leads from any source, any online source or, or phone or you know broker interest and whatever it is. Um, it tracks the, literally every action of the broker from the time that lead comes in to the time that it gets assigned to the broker. Um, gives you know times how long it takes them to enter the information and get the quote. Rating is built right into it. Um, document generation. So we actually create the document from within this system. We warp it to both the portals and to the BMS system. Uh, E-signature is built in. Um, it's, it's, it's everything that's kind of built into this uh, system. And it's been, it's been a big part of what's accelerated the growth for Sharp Insurance. Like we can get a policy bound beginning to end auto policy beginning to end, full underwriting, CGI, um, you know, embedded embedded in it. So pulling the Auto Plus, MVR, kind of everything um, in under 15 minutes. And that was kind of the big part of the magic. So then we have True Leads. We're now rebuilding True Leads to take out a bunch of the pieces that were from Sharp One, building it into True Leads, and, you know, really turning it into a, an insanely powerful tool for, uh, for brokers in, that, in a lot of ways. Okay, Amazing. Sharif. I want to bring this back down to a thousand feet for for most for a lot of people listening, and that's like everything that we're talking about here sounds very complicated. And you know, I have a five person shop, a fifteen person shop, whatever. This this sounds like how can I manage all this kind of stuff? So 
uh, it sounds very big broker business. Who's the best client in the sense of, or, or, or best customer? Are you good for me as a five man shop, a 10 man shop, a 12 man shop? Because everything we're talking about here sounds very high level. Like it, it's kind of intimidating, right? Yeah, I mean, our, our, we're, we're for every brokerage. I mean, if we think about, we built Sharp One, let's say, you know, which is this internal tool for Sharp and Chips. We built it back in 2014. At that time, we were probably a 15 person shop. Right, like we were, we were, we were a small broker. Like people remember, we started Sharp. We were a two-person operation when we started, and then we started deploying technology to help us accelerate faster. But the big key here, part of the reason why we were able to accelerate like that was it wasn't just because of the digital tools we were using inside. We were using digital tools to drive business in. I mean, it doesn't matter how good of the digital tools you have if you don't have opportunities coming, you know, knocking at your door. You don't have leads coming in. It, do, it doesn't matter. So what, we're, what we'd love to do is take that five-person operation, apply a bunch of our digital tools, you know, in different parts of the operation and help them get to a 20-person operation and take a 50-person operation, help them get to a 100-person operation and take a 500-person operation and, you know. So I'm, I'm floating the boat, but I know I need to do something. Then Truffle is a good solution to, to round out my BMS. And it, yeah. and it won't be complicated for me. Yeah, and that's why I go back to what you were saying earlier. Are you guys at BMS? No, because you can take one little part here, right? And you can start with this here, and we can help you build this yeah. here. And then we're going to add on a little a little piece here. You know, we're going to add on a little more to get you growing. Then we can add on another piece here, or you can start over here. You can start however you want. As you kind of add on the pieces you know, it starts to, the system starts to behave a little differently because now you've got systems that are talking to each other, right? And, and, they're, yeah. and they're starting to behave and look a little bit, uh, a little bit different. But no, it's, it's intended to be very flexible, very light, very modular. So, so what I'm hearing is that, that you're, uh, you can take the baby steps. For sure. We encourage Good. people to take the baby steps. So I'm going to change gears uh, a little bit. And the next question is throughout this journey that, that you've created here with uh, all the things that you've done digitally within our business and you've been uh, bleeding edge on a lot of stuff. What's the biggest thing that's standing in our way of, of making better progress? Consistency of data. Absolute number one thing. So who, who owns that? Data. Who owns that? Good question. Is it is it a, a broker thing? Is it a Cisio thing? Is it a carrier thing? I mean, I think we all know that you know the data standard is kind of set as uh, you know Cisio, but has it been you know kind of you know has it been managed properly you know over the years and not because of anything Cisio did. I mean, you've got carriers. In the insurance world, we think so much different than, let's say, banking. In the banking world, all the companies got together and said, we agree on one standard. We agree we're going to do checks a certain way. We're going to do uh, data movement, you know, for interact a certain way. We're all going to we're all going to try to slit each other's throat, but we're going to work, uh, you know, for the for the greater good of uh, of the consumer, right? So let the consumer kind of decide. We didn't do that in insurance. In insurance, we want to slit each other's throats. But we're also going to try to hide everything, right? We're going, to, we're going to create these things called Z codes, and we're going to try to put all this data in the Z codes, and we're not going to be consistent with how we, we, we send the data. So one carrier will send, yeah, we're going to give all the, the data because it's good. Other carriers will be like, oh, we're going to send some of the, the data. I don't know if we necessarily need to send all of the all Or of we're the, going to wipe out data. data. <laughs> or we're going to wipe out. Or we're going to wipe out data. You know, you know, it, it's 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 all over the place. So there there really isn't any consistency. And good question. Who does who does own it? What I'd love well, to yeah, see. Yeah, who owns this? And ultimately, my opinion is that uh, the direction we need to take as brokers is that oh, we own it. We one hundred percent. I think brokers need to own it. Again, I am a very big believer, and I am the biggest you know flag waver that the the real winners in all this and. Most of you have heard me say this for a long time, especially Tom. Um, brokers are ultimately going to win the, the game. They're going to win the long game. There is too much. Uh, brokers are too similar to, are more similar 
to um, big digital companies that are that are changing the world than a direct uh, writer is because a direct writer isn't going to give you the kind of choice and isn't going to give you kind of you know everything you need to give the consumer the experience they want. Brokers have the ability; they just need the tools to do it. That that's really it. That's what I'm hearing is we have the ability again, and I've probably said this about four or five times throughout this season this year is we have the ability to retake market share like gangbusters if we can just reduce the complexity ask lemonade that they went one way and now they're reverting back to the other uh, yeah. to the other way absolutely okay. brokers are still going to win this game in the long run did you uh, i think did everybody see danish's uh from uh, zen insurance post i think we've been chatting about it got a lot of eyeballs about the, the directs bragging about how much better their experiences is he thinks the directs are so great he insures his own personal policy i think with sonnet uh, he's a broker, but he uses Sonnet, which I found very interesting. But his argument and his points are brokers have a better value proposition. Lance Miller from Surex agrees with it, but our experience is clunky. You know, there's too much friction because, there, you know, pro company APIs, the number of things. Sharif, what do you think in the future? How are we going to bridge this gap? Data and some of the solutions you come up with have done that. How can we make it less intrusive? How can we use straight through processing on auto? Or can we? Is it too complicated of a product? You still need the advice? Or how do we go to that next level? What do you see? It was a lot more complicated. I mean, I can tell you horror stories of what we've had to do to get data moving between different systems and whatnot. And I'm just really, I'm gonna say, I'm just very lucky. Uh, we've got some really smart people that have kind of been able to tackle this and, uh, and, 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 and solve it. Um, but yeah, it is, it is, but it's definitely gotten, gotten better. It's gotten way better. And there is definitely, we're not, it's not a future thing, it's here now absolutely a broker can replicate and improve even on that experience that a direct writer uh, that a direct writer has it's been proven already you've got your lances that do it your adam mitchells that, uh, that, that that do it there's a number of brokers that that, that pull that uh, that pull that off um no no there is no there was an advantage i don't think there is anymore it's just brokers embracing it now and just you know and and and, and putting it into action, you know, executing and, and, and making waves. I love the statements. I, I, I feel like I've known you for near a decade now. And, um, you know, we get sucked into all the same company committees and things and travels and conference and peace. And you've always been one of the more forward thinkers and or one of the best sort of visionaries, um, you know, in our, in our group of friends of digital brokers. And I, I love these statements. So I, I compliment you there and, and, and get you, fluffed up for this this next one of um also off script um so you help or offer to help a number of brokers with their lead generation and you you had some fun lines that have been shared over the years of you know a mouse trap with no cheese is, is no good of a trap right like you you got to get the lead and the opportunity to to go anywhere from there and so as a supplier or teacher of Amanda Fish, um, what what are your thoughts as a visionary of how brokers should think of of aggregators and or what do you think of this whole ecosystem? Aggregators are fine. They're you know they're they're, they're a good way to, to generate a lead. Uh, they are not the, the the aggregators of Canada are not the aggregators that have absolutely uh, you know overturned. Uh, certain markets like the like the UK, primarily because they cannot complete the experience. It's a bro so you get the quote, and then it stops. <laughs> if a broker can rank the same as an aggregator and get there up there, and I've said it, I I actually really believe the especially the latest tool that we launched, the data module, is going to give insane power to brokers to be able to compete on, in the search engine world in a big way. And if they can get that experience, that quoting experience to match up to what an aggregator has and then they can finish the experience, they're gonna win. And winning doesn't necessarily mean you're doing double the volume. You just need to be ahead by, by a bit. Those, that bit makes a monster difference in a, in a, in, in, in a big industry, right? Um, so aggregators, for, especially for brokers that are, that are, that are kind of dipping their toe in, they want to start getting, you know, they want to grow. We know a lot of 
even digital brokers that use that model to, to grow. Is it a great model to grow? Yeah. Is it the, the is it the model that that, that that's going to get you to the you know to the promise line? No. You got to be able to stand up on your two feet. Your website has to be able to 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 be found on its on on its own. Otherwise, you're just a broker who's buying some leads, and you know you haven't really established your presence, your place, your brand, your you know your foothold. So let's put SEO aside for a second. Go to SEM. Because SEM, you could fire up tomorrow and have tomorrow results with tomorrow's landing page, and there you go. You can start training a sales team to go. What's your what's your off the cuff hip shot of a number where you'd feel confident in saying, "Yeah, Tom, your brokerage wants to start up." Um, I'd estimate you're going to have uh, leads at a cost of X. Like, is is your sort of national SEM experience that you're thinking ten dollars, twenty dollars, a hundred dollars? I understand we got to put the caveat on that all situations will vary, but you might have bought more AdWords than anybody else. What's your guess? Your minimum is, you know, because I got to blend it in between a bunch of different things. You're 25 yeah. to 30 bucks. I wouldn't just look 25 at 25 to 30 is still still a good value compared to some other options out there. The, the problem yeah. is it's not the cost of the lead though. It's a conversion. If you're getting $25 leads and you're converting at Man. 5%, that doesn't mean that you're over a thousand dollar acquisition cost. So you have yeah. to look yeah. at it. But There's a lot of people who generate cheap leads, but they can't close anything. Or they're closing I such fully agree level. that I fully agree. And you should be running it to the tools. I'm a giant proponent of track the data, report on the data. And if you don't know your acquisition costs, you don't know anything. Right. But what I want to flush out is here's a supplier of leads that could compete with other suppliers of leads. And yeah, if you, if you do the entire landing page in SEM on your brand, on your solution, you could have an avenue that's much more sustainable. You could for sure, um, but you gotta have the stomach for it. You know, going down the aggregator road, you know, you kind of know from day one, you know, that the, the, you flip the switch on, the leads are coming in. The SEM road is, like it's, it's definitely faster than the SEO road, but it's not as fast as the, <laughs> you still got to have yeah, some, yeah. some stuff. You got to have totally some stuff, right? You got to have some stuff. There's, the, there's no mystery in any of it. And I guess where I want to lay this out for anyone listening or watching is like, these are all viable options today. And if you start on SEO, best case scenario of all the perfect moves, you'll see your first result in six months, maybe very strong chance you'll start to see lift going into the second year and things and you'll decide if you're making the right moves sem you can turn it on yeah you're, you're this month next month you're right like firing up aggregators of which we're down to like two of them now like there's not there's not many left um a quick question to shift things up here uh, good questions adam is uh you know, the, the broker of the future, what do you see in the next five years? Your good friend, Bruce Rabick, uh, who's a member of CBN. Also, uh, Steve and I are a member of Canadian Broker Network. Uh, I'd like to, first of all, you know, you've been a longer member. Maybe talk about the value of networks moving forward. Bruce, I think in Amplify made a sweeping statement that you're either going to be part of a bigger collective uh, that's you know, hopefully independent and owned by brokers, or you're going to be bought up by, you know, uh, BrokerLink, Hub, one of the uh, big aggregators. How do you feel about that? What do you think the future of the broker chain is? What does it look like in five years? I'm going to say it depends. So I agree with a lot of what, what Bruce says. I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of big, uh, you know, there's going to be, uh, you know, we're, we're going to enter very quickly, if we're not already here, into the age of this kind of the super broker. These monstrosities that have this huge scale and stuff like that. And the thing with scale is that scale allows you a lot of resources to do other things, right? Especially when it comes to technology and whatnot. But, big but, scale and size also means you're slow. You cannot <laughs> you know? pivot. You can't pivot. You cannot pivot. You can, and remember, a lot of these bigger guys, not only are they slow to pivot, but if th their models are all about the return. So the yes. ability to invest heavy into doing certain things isn't quite as, like, it could go either, it could go either way. But the big thing is you're, you're slow. So when you're smaller, you're definitely a lot more nimble. The problem is, not a lot of brokers are moving that fast. So they're just, you know, a lot of brokers are just saying, oh God, like that, I'm just, I'm, you know, it's going to take me a lot of work. I mean, Steve, you brought it up, you know, it's overwhelming for a lot of brokers. You know, do you do this? Do you do this? But, but Sharif, you know, um, for a small broker, the advantage is you can get off the pot and back on again really quick if you yeah. want. 
Absolutely. Big organizations can't do that. No, you no. can't. No. Like, you're the Montrose, I like, Mon, it sounds like a Bohemian Rhapsody, Montrose D uh, of Mon scale, Trust right? <laughs> you know, you got, you got the, uh, you got the uh, small, you got the uh, speedboat versus the ocean liner, right? To give it a comparison yeah. of boats, right? Yeah, and uh, you don't have, you know, the bigger equity funded brokers. They're looking to get a 35, 40% EBITDA and they're, how do we get there? How do we get that? But at some point you don't reinvest in the business and at what point can they continue to keep up? Do they have the scale to do that? Great questions to ask, right? You know, I think the one thing on this, you know, some of the people in the podcast here, everybody's, you know, launch, failing, learning, fixing. They're taking some risk. They're trying new things. They're, un they're comfortable being uncomfortable, right? I'd like and, to understand. And, and Jeff, yeah, those yeah. are the things that small brokers can do. Yeah. Big brokers can. Yeah. A Adam, was asking fail, earlier, Adam was asking earlier, how many things, you know, did, 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 you know, Sharp or Trueflow or whatever come up with that were, you know, you know, kind of industry first. I I come up with three, four, you know, even struggle getting into five things, but I can give you thirty things like that of everything we didn't do, right? And where we and where we where we screwed up along the way. Because yeah. we were small. We were kind of you know, we could we could we could navigate and you know quickly and just pivot and oh okay. Oh yeah. We have horror stories. Fail, first so, attempt in learning, fail forward, you know, basically great job. Yeah, Sorry, go go ahead. We're about to wrap up here and uh it's been a long show. I would love to do this again and not talk about just bringing in businesses and growing businesses, but what's going on inside with our renewals and the complexity of dealing with the business that we have on the book sometimes. Well, here, let me throw this one out. That'll be a nice segue to that, right? And, uh, you know, a lot of broker owners don't actually know this, but if they do the math on this, they'll figure it out pretty quick. 5% improvement in retention doubles the profitability of a brokerage. Doubles. So you can't just, you don't want to just look at, yep. that's why when yep. we're looking at everything, we're looking at the entire operation and digitizing the entire operation, not just the front end, you know, because, you know, I, I, yeah, I want to bring in business, but if I can make you more profitable too, you're going to take that and you're going to bring more into the, in, into the front end. If you can keep that, you're going to bring more into the front end. And we, Adam, you and I learned that the hard way over over the years holy man did we learn that one the hard way you can't just be a sieve you know you're bringing in the business just you know kind of flying out the the, the, the back door yeah at the end of the day Sharif, we're using technology to be improve our kpis right we're trying to write more clients reduce co uh, acquisition cost reduce cost of lead improve retention you know that's what we're trying to do and whether it's technology that helps us do it our people it's that combination of all those things wrapped around our brand that makes us who we are right and everybody's trying to get a little bit better every day if you get half percent better every week by the end of the year look where you're at and it feels like a lot of times in the trenches you don't really feel what you've done then when you look back it's amazing and as, as adam mentioned looking back in your career and what you've done since 2010 and how you've uh, you know transformed the industry you've had to build things along the way you've had to keep leveling up and uh, you know you went from bankruptcy to being now to being a traffic cop of data with your different lights you know if you look at the journey it's uh, it's quite a journey and again you're still having fun doing it that's the main thing you still get out of bed you still like insurance you know insurance has never been funner or I wouldn't say funner is probably not the best <laughs> term but it's a nice grammar right tell us from 12 hour day here but uh, it's never been a more exciting time to be in in the insurance business, right? Like, you know, it, it's uh, insurance is a fun time right now, even though it's more super difficult, and not a lot of fun, a lot of days There's some cool stuff emerging. And we're on the cusp of the next shift, as you said, right? So really cool. Really cool points. Just sitting back, reflecting a little bit. We had a bit of a slow start then, but clearly we hit a few of Sharif's hot buttons and things got, things got loud and, and boisterous quick, which is fabulous. So Sharif, we're going to, we're going to head into the, uh, the tail end of the, uh, the episode here. So I've got two more questions for you or one question and one offer. So the question is, given all we've talked about today, what one problem would you, if you had a magic wand, right? The, you know, the metaphorical magic consistency wand. Of data. Consistency, consistency of data. Consistency of data. Okay. Consistency that's that's data. the problem you fixed. Okay. Awesome. And um, now the offer is let's uh, first of all, let's, we need to give an offer of thanks out to our sponsors, so to uh, Crew and to Gore uh, Mutual and to Garrison Brewing, thank you very much. So uh, raise a glass, boys, cheers to our sponsors. And I realize with my background, you can't actually see it. <laughs> so trust me, there was a beer in my hand at one point. 
Yeah, a big, a big <laughs> shout out to a big shout out to Wick too. So, thank you, Jeff. I was just getting there, and um, so the offer now, uh, Sharif, give us your closing thoughts. We'll give you, you know, a minute, two minutes. Tell us, tell us, tell our viewers anything you want to tell us. Go for it. Brokers are going to win. Brokers are are are, are set up to to win. Um, you know, I, I don't think I've ever been more bullish on uh, brokerages. I actually do believe that we are in, you know, as, a, as an insurance broker, the greatest business in the history of, uh, of, of mankind. I'm so lucky to be, uh, to be in this business. And I'm so excited and I'm, I'm lucky too to, to be part of helping brokers win the game in the long run because man over the years a broker's been beat up the direct writers and the, the carriers are going to come do this and then this is you know brokers are dead and holy man are they thriving and growing and even when you see insure techs now switching you know their models to distribute through you know what was once thought to be a, a you know a dead model uh-uh it's going to grow and you know, bet on, bet on brokers, bet on yourselves. You just need the tools to, to, to get it done right. Uh, Sharif, on behalf of Adam, Steve, and Jeff, really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, always a pleasure to chat with you. Not our first time, won't be our last. And I know um, our viewers will appreciate hearing from you. So thank you very much. That was awesome. That started off a little slow, but then uh, started to really uh, get engaged. I saw a lot of uh, interest and in, from him, from Sharif, but definitely from you guys as well. Obviously, we hit a number of hot buttons through that episode. So, uh, what, Steve, what stood out for you? Um, as I said before, I'd really like to get to, you know, Sharif's rap doing the envelope around the BMS. But the yep. BMS, inside the BMS, there's so much complexity going on right now that is dragging us down and um, insurers are contributing to that. I'd, I'd really like to have a discussion on that. That could be season three for us. Yep. An entire season dedicated to, dedicated to that. Complexity, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I totally see us doing some more breaking stuff down, you know, sharing some slides, getting into the nitty gritty. I think a lot of the viewers would like that, so totally think it'd be cool. Yeah, Adam, what's your take on the on the on the episode in general on on Sharif and what he's doing, yeah. what he was talking about? I, I think the episode's great. I think it'll speak to itself. I think a lot of people will get a bunch of different things out of it. I, I I'm going to comment on Sharif. Like, what what an incredible story, and what, and what an incredible guy. I mean, we've got along for a long time, and you know, we've had our own differences or arguments or agreements and pieces, but. It, what a total rags to riches story. Like I, that's the first time I ever knew that he had officially declared bankruptcy and, and through trying, he tried something out, it failed and up he goes. And, you know, now he's, you know, owning one of the bigger broker operations going. And uh, th this is my prediction of bet. He's going to go down in, in our generation or history um, as one of the greatest insurance stories in, in Canada, right? Like I he's agree. not done yet. Well, he's gonna you, he's gonna probably five x that thing another time. I'll tell you a quick story about Sharif. So I was I was one of the first among the first few people to meet him when he joined the insurance industry because I think Sherry Newell was the exec or one of the execs that impacted on his first contract. But then he needed you know he had literally had a office on top of a I would say falafel, but I think it was a shawarma shop. Uh, shawarma. Yeah. Yeah. shawarma yeah actually it was everyone. shawarma because he actually gave everybody a free shawarma when he wrote a policy <laughs> oh, no, it's yeah, just like, yeah. It's, yeah. It's so, yeah. so he, had, he had this shop where somebody literally crashed in the building and uh, you know the force of the blow actually knocked him into his desk so that's that's where he was anyway he needed a new office and around the same time I was a COO at Berkelink and we were looking to sublet an office and I said to our real estate guys like no brokers because this was an office right beside a registry high foot traffic like it was, if another broker had gone in there, like we would have lost half our business like, like that. So I said to our real estate guys, like I would rather keep paying the lease on an empty office and have another broker go in there. So I said, no brokers. So they're having a hard time getting rid of it. And then uh, Sherry Newell called me up and said, you know, hey, Sharif, you know, Sharp Insurance wants to sub up the office. And I said, no, like forget it. Like Sherry, I love you, but 
not happening. And she said, meet with Sharif. So we had lunch together and he said to me, Tom, there's, I'm not going to take your clients. We'll have a sign. We'll tell our staff, any CBL clients, we'll ship them back to you. And for some reason I believed him, right? I thought, Hey, this guy seems trustworthy. And he was true to his word. Like we didn't lose, uh, well, obviously we lost a few clients because you don't keep 100% retention, but the retention stayed exactly the same. You know, for the 18 months that our agreement uh, lasted for, um, we kept the exact same retention that we'd had historically. So he did not, he was true to his word. And that was my first interaction with him and it was super positive. Well, if you, if you just were to, to nuke the, the broker world, the insurance world in Canada and say, hey, starting tomorrow, there's a whole new set of rules. Fuck, he'll be the first one to scurry to the top of starting to figure it out. And then you change it again in six months and he'll do it again. Like it's just that relentless can do innovative attitude of pieces. Like it's Elon yeah. Musk esque, Steve Jobs esque of like, I don't care what the rules are. I'm going to figure out a better way. Chime That's in. Or, uh, yeah, go, 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 Jeff. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> when do you wait your turn? Oh my. Yeah, just, uh, just, just waiting, just waiting. Okay, that's man. a DIPP first. <laughs> Jeff waited his turn. <laughs> waited my turn. So, I thought we were closing off in sequence, right? So, no, great points, guys. I did all everything you said, one hundred percent. I've known Sharif since twenty sixteen. Uh, love all the things he's done. We use his Truffula product. We've been working with him to help innovate it. He's listed for our feedback. He's working on some cool stuff in 2021. So I am bullish what he's doing. And I'm excited to see, like, he's announced some things that Amplify. I like the fact that he's come up with the Amplify conference, totally free, 100%. He's got some cool speakers. He's got stuff out there to help brokers. And he's doing it selfishly. So he's trying to raise the whole industry, not just himself. You know, Sharif's always been a giver. You know, it's not just about him. It's about, you know, doing things better. So super guy excited to have him back in season three.